Welcome to Construct Tech TV. Today we will be looking at the top five tech trends for construction. This includes, it happened this month, the top three smart cities, the most expensive city to build, healthy homes, and the impact of mentoring. First up, it happened this month in March 1876 when Alexander Graham Bell was granted a patent for the telephone. Just think about how the phone has evolved since that one simple call. In the early days, push to talk was an easy way to communicate at the job site. Now, I will bet most of you in construction will remember that. Since then, Steve Jobs' invention of the iPhone and the subsequent plethora of millions of apps has completely changed the course of communication pretty much for all of us. So what once began as an interesting hardwired device has been transformed into a powerful cellular gadget that it seems most of us just can't live without. And today, the cell phone is perhaps one of the most important tools on the construction job site. And who would have thought it all started with a patent from Alexander Graham Bell 141 years ago this month? Next up, the top three smart cities in the United States. Now, I wanted to give you the top three smart cities that you might not know. Coming in at number three is Chattanooga. It is known as the gig city. Every home and business gets one gigabyte per second of internet speed. This is enabling new research in biology and STEM. Coming in at number two is Charlotte. Envision Charlotte as a public-private collaboration. It looks to improve sustainability, quality of life through data collection. It demonstrates how government and technology companies can work together. And it has expanded it into a larger America initiative, so to speak. Coming in at number one is San Francisco. The city is redefining urban transportation. Technology will help repurpose public space into affordable housing, and it will eliminate fatal collisions through avoidance technology and connected vehicles. What's exciting here is the city is partnering with UC Berkeley to test best practices and pilot these programs with other transportation agencies. The objective is to create a city with zero traffic deaths, zero transportation emissions, and to get everyone where they want to go. So those are your top three smart cities. Now my question is, would you have guessed it? Now let's look at the most expensive cities for construction. These come from the International Construction Cost Report from Arcadis. Hong Kong and Geneva, Switzerland make up two of the top three. The third one is in the United States. Have you guessed the city yet? It's New York City. Not much of a surprise, Large-scale construction projects and international investors drive development. But here is something that might be of interest. New York is almost 50% more expensive in construction costs than the national average in the United States. And it is 20% higher than other major cities like Chicago, Los Angeles, Seattle, or Boston. Maybe we should have our new president look into those construction costs. Step aside smart homes, hello healthy homes. This is being researched at the University of Kansas School of Architecture, Design and Planning. Students are exploring big data and sensing technology in the home and they are tying it into collecting biometric data. The goal here is to monitor health. For instance, the floor could monitor heel strikes. This would indicate if someone has fallen. Smart mirrors could also look for changes in our skin. Here to explain it is Joe Calistra, Associate Professor at the School of Architecture, Design, and Planning at the University of Kansas. So Joe, let's talk about this idea of a healthy home. You know, it's, it's really exciting times when we talk about smart cities and things like that. What's your view of a healthy home? Yeah, so we've, uh, we've been looking at housing in Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri one of the first cities to come online with a gigabit network. And so one of the things we've been looking at is how you would approach housing if you had unlimited bandwidth. And so what are the so what are the, some of the data points you could start to collect? And we found very quickly one of the most important things is biometric data. So we're looking at how to collect biometric data through the built environment 
and then use population health strategies to deliver health care more affordably and more effectively. And, and we think sometimes before you even know you need health care. So how would you take this data that you're talking about, Joe, and carry it into other parts of our lives that we're thinking about every day? Sure. Well, you know, one of the things we're looking at is uh, gate analysis. And so we're looking at a two-way steel flooring system that would have accelerometers in it. And this is used often for monitoring structural stability, but it also can be calibrated to pick up heel strike. So one of the things we're looking at is whether someone's beginning to limp or favor one side over another, whether they're dragging their feet, all of which can be uh, determinants of falling in the future or early onset Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. We're also starting to look at circadian rhythm uh, adjusted lighting and LED lights that can be adjusted to help you fall asleep at night, wake up in the morning. And we're also looking at a really exciting smart toilet, which starts to take hydration readings. And this is the real potential, I think, of population health. It takes hydration readings and then couples the data from your hydration readings to an automated medicine dispenser to automatically adjust diuretic and heart medication. If so you, you can, can find imagine that's really powerful. If you can find a smart toilet to clean for myself, I'm all over the smart toilet. So if that's what you're saying, I really like that. Smart toilet knows how to clean itself. I'm all in now, Joe. I think you just made me really happy. But So when you say this hydration, I'm, I'm kidding aside, but when you say hydration and things like that, I love the idea of assisted living and the things that you're talking about. Are these going to change the way we think? I, I know you talk about strikes and healing and, and things like that. But are we talking about being able to see things that happen in ways we haven't imagined yet? I mean, are, I mean, you have some ideas, but are you thinking about that? Because we're getting older, more people are living longer, that they can stay in their homes more because you can. the home is reacting to the way we live longer in our homes. And, and, and it's, it's sensing things that we do and feel in our homes. That, that, that reaction is what you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think aging in place is really important right now and and there's there's so many people that are that are coming online that are needing more assistance in housing and assisted living and uh the, most rates for assisted living is not very affordable and so trying to bring this to the masses and trying to put it in housing projects that may be in the background we've all heard about the wonderful uh opportunities for fall detection and prevention through fitbits and apple watches but for most of us, uh, most of our parents are not wearing Apple Watches. They wouldn't know how to turn them on, would be a little reluctant to, to use those automated devices. So having this through sensors in the, in the floors, in the background, in the walls of our unit can help us uh, monitor more people more efficiently and maybe in the background for people that uh, wouldn't be able to use that technology. And so when we're thinking about this, will we be using this technology with other things in our homes? I mean, our tablets and our, our, our caregivers, is that how they'll be able to react if something should happen and know what's happening in our lives that way? Yeah. Well, what's so exciting is we don't even know how some of this data will be used. I, I think that big data is like a new natural resource, and it's probably as impactful for laying out our cities as water and electricity were 100 years ago. And so one of the things we're looking at is just how we would collect all these data points. Uh, and if you start to overlay, for instance, one of the things we've been looking at is how you bring all the data together to make smart population health decisions. And so if you take hydration readings from the toilet, um, someone beginning to have balance issues from the gait analysis, you overlay that with maybe sleep sensors that you can see someone's only had four hours of sleep for a number of nights in a row. And you overlay that with data that we don't even know about yet, like uh, the temperature or it, there's ice on the sidewalk outside or the, it's the end of the month. And so a lot of seniors are starting to ration their medication. These population health uh, data points and analysis can start to really fine tune, let's say, in a city of 100,000 people, there's 1% that have a 95% chance of falling tomorrow. That's really powerful information for organizing our cities. So really think about it this way. For a builder, how do we put this in the perspective that this matters for builders in the homes that they're building? So is this technology that they can say they can put this in the new structures that they're putting up and saying, this is how you need to think about what you're doing in the new homes of the future? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the most uh, one of the most technologically advanced things we're looking at is gate analysis, like I mentioned. And gate analysis done in a lab 
for sports kinesiology departments and, and uh, high-tech uh, scientists and doctors is a really expensive lab. What we're looking at is like a poor man's gate analysis, where if you took a steel floor or even a wood floor that's stiff enough to pick up the vibrations of someone walking, you can calibrate the accelerometers in the floor to pick up that gate or the heel strike. And so just having that ability to put that in floors is really powerful. We're assuming that this technology is going to need to be swapped out every two or three years. So access panels, modularity, uh, prefabricated walls and floors, even the panelization that we see going on now. We're working with two wall manufacturers, Prescient and also BuildSmart, and looking at how, in addition to having passive house certified multifamily housing, you could actually put the sensors in before it leaves the warehouse. And this does, this does two things, really. First of all, it allows you to swap out technology really quickly. It also begins to bring down the cost because you can, uh, in federally funded subsidized housing, you can avoid Davis-Bacon wages by having a prefabricated system. So we're trying to look at different development models that would pay for this and allow for not only the technology, but the maintenance and future upkeep to be paid for. So really what we're seeing here is if we took prefabrication and we're taking that, we then could extend it to what we're doing into building information modeling and collaboration. And so builders can actually see this into so much more of the technology they're already using and expand it with the big data in that way. Yeah, we have to. There's so many seniors coming online that need affordable housing. We're in the millions of, of units that need to be built. And so I don't think we're going to be able to do it with stick frame construction like we do out of the back of a pickup truck nowadays. Um, the, the new model is prefabrication and whether that's panelized walls or entire units that get shipped to site, I, I really think that's the future. That just makes it more easy for us to put some of this technology in. Well, is there anything else we need to, to get our builders excited about? Because now you're showing them a whole new way of technology that they might not even have thought about before. Well, I think the cost is going to come down. I think it's going to make healthier environments. And with prefabrication, housing units start to have the precision of a medical device. So what we once called rough framing is now made on a nailing bed with, uh, you know, an exact engineered lumbered wood. There's no warping. There's no waste. And that... Um, that analogy to a medical device is really exciting because it's the idea that your housing unit or your built environment can actually start to take care of you. Well, Joe, it's been great to have you on the show. Thank you so much, and we wish you continued success. Thank you for having me. Our final tech trend of the day is the impact of mentoring. The company's name is Current Builder, and its mission is to invest in advanced technology. This general contractor is using drone and virtual reality technology. This is going to help enhance safety protocols. The technology shows team members' conditions that could be hazardous. And here's the really cool part. They show them these conditions in 3D before they even step on the job site. So that is one example of how technology can enhance safety and even resolve issues at the job site. That's your tech update for today. <music>